Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. We got acquainted with the melee theory last time, and we're going to continue more in our next conversation with Casey Kern and Greg Pavone to find out some other considerations. What are some things that really add strength to the melee theory? So uh, is obviously we're not going to explain all the answers, but you're definitely going to want to check this out. Casey's got some amazing clips, so check out youtube.com slash gospel tangents, and you can see some of the amazing uh, still images and, and video clips that uh, Casey's added and gotten permission to add. And so it's a fantastic thing. So Casey, I just want to thank you again for your amazing video work. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. So check out our conversation. Well, you know, the one thing, when I, when I talked to Ralph, um, he, he had a heck of a time. He wanted it to be reviewed, even if it was negatively, be, negatively reviewed by BYU. And I know that, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an African theory, uh, Melikin, I think his name is. That, that one falls apart pretty much immediately because, yeah. yeah. But, um, but BYU reviewed that one, but for some reason, they, nobody will take this theory seriously i do have to give credit to uh to brent gardner he has written an article on the interpreter where he he reviews it oh i didn't know that yeah yeah he does like a methodology he's like you know kind of what i was talking about like here's the abstract map and then we can evaluate points and he kind of reviews the uh, uh not based on ralph's book but ralph run a sunstone article where he kind of runs through it and and just kind of you know reviews that and he finds well this is a match this is a match his main point he had some quibbles about that where bountiful is located relative to the narrow neck I'm like, but come on, that that's you, you, you can move it around, make it work. Uh, I, I didn't think that that was a deal breaker. The other thing was like, well, you know, the Mil Malay Peninsula has the general outline. It's like, but so does South America. I'm like, yeah, but South America doesn't have the right distances. The Malay Pen Peninsula has both the right shape and it has the distances that, that then kind of forced the, you know, the, what do they call it? The limited geography theory of like, look, right. if they're traveling from point A to point B in 14 days, they're not going from Peru to Ohio in, in 14 right. days. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think I, I have some, some quibbles with, with what, with Brent's uh, approach. I, I'm very grateful that he, that he did, you know, give it the time of day. Uh, and I had corresponded with him a little bit as I was, as I was looking uh, into this. But um, you know, it does have the, the general outline of, of South America, but it's it's it, this can't just be written off the way South America can be because uh, you know the distances match. Well, that was pretty much the deal breaker for the hemispheric model. Um, the, the Malay works on on that front. Well, and I told Ralph, um, I talked to him on the phone and said my biggest problem with the theory. How in the world did Moroni get the plates from the Malay Peninsula to New York? And have you talked to Ralph? Did did you did you run that by him? No, not about that uh, specifically. But he he does have a section on it. He he actually uh, uh, hypothesizes that that Moroni was a seafarer, uh, and you know, and he was a navy man. <laughs> I understand like the instinct is like, ah, you know, that's mental gymnastics and, and this is nonsense. And like, that's too much of a stretch. But like for any believing perspective, you have to account for Nephi and Lehi and the Jaredites and the Mulekites doing these enormous yeah. transoceanic. Trans <laughs> uh, did, he, did he build a Jaredite submarine? Is that it? <laughs> you know, that's really only one, one option. Um, the, the other thing is one, and this has been discussed elsewhere. I don't want to get too much into this. The Book of Mormon doesn't say that, that the plates were buried in, in Kamar. In fact, it says the opposite. It says all the plates except the plates of Mormon were, were built in Kamar, were, were, were uh, buried. buried buried in Kamar. And that's where, you know, it's like, well, you know, there's the Kamar that we call Kamar now actually isn't and, and whatnot. And again, I, I don't want to uh, dive too too deep in, into that, but um, you know, we, we have the, the, the concept of he's, he's got the plates, he's got to put them somewhere that Joseph Smith can, can receive them. Well, if, if we back up a little bit and just think about the three witnesses experience, uh, it, um, they see the angel and the angel brings the plates with, with him, right? <laughs> uh, and he has them on a table and, and then when he leaves the plates leave with him. So uh, we already have established that the angel can take the plates where he darn well pleases. Um, so, you know, like the, uh, the, the linchpin of like, we have to locate uh, a living Moroni in, 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 in upstate New York. New York. 
uh, I think there are some assumptions that could be challenged there. Well, yeah, and because that's kind of what Ralph said, you know, if we believe in miracles, he could get here any way he wanted. Plus, I think there was the uh, issue that isn't it thirty years that Moroni lived another thirty years after the last war, and so he could have traveled pretty much anywhere on the world in thirty years. That's plausible, and I think the Mesoamerican theory kind of uh, follows or goes into that refuge for for explaining. Well, yeah, and Mezzo basically has kind of a two Camorra theory that there was the Camorra in, you know, Central America and then Camorra in New York. Um, I, I know, I think uh, the Heartlanders don't like that and make fun of that, but. I think, I think the, the case is strong that the one in New York, uh, you know, even it was, it was Gold Libel Hill known by the locals and, and Joseph Smith just calls it a hill. And uh, I know there, there's some document from Oliver Cowdery starts, call, starts referring to, to Camorra early, early on. Um, but, uh, you know, even, even that is, is a, an assumption that, uh, that is not bulletproof. With God, all things are possible. With God, anything's possible? All yeah. things are possible. Yeah. So, um, I know Ralph also talked a little bit about language similarities, but he's not a linguist. And I, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the characters document. I, I would love, I mean, if this is really a legit thing, it would be great if somebody, you know, a linguist could say, hey, does this compare to Burmese or Malay or whatever, or whatever the language yeah, is? I think the biggest candidate is, is actually this Leke script, which is tied to the, to the Karen people. Um, but, you know, the, the, it's a language that is that is uh, on the verge of extinction and seems to have changed a lot. It has it's, it's already had a lot of Burmese influence based on, on how it's written and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting, but I, I don't I'm not holding my breath for for any confirmation on, on that front. Right. I, I will tell, just mention one other thing. I, I mentioned Simka Yakubovich, which is a horrible name to spell, but um, with the in relation to the Jesus tomb, he has another uh, film. He's a documentarian, and um, he says, "Where are the lost ten tribes?" Now, Simka is really interesting in the fact that he's a, he's kind of an atheist Jew. He doesn't believe in Judaism or Jesus or anything. So it's interesting that he's finding. The Jesus tomb, and he, it's interesting that he's he's following the lost ten tribes. But I was watching this one time, and I I called Ralph the next day because it, Simka tries to identify where the lost ten tribes have gone, and in one place was Afghanistan, another place was in Africa. I think that was the tribe of Dan. They've actually done some genetic testing on that that may have confirmed that. Um, but a third place was the Malay Peninsula. And I was like, you're kidding me. In a tomato packing plant near the Gaza Strip, I came across a small group that most Israelis take for Thai guest workers. They are a people who come from the hill country on the India-Burma border. They say they are descendants of the lost tribe of Menashe. And there is at least one rabbi here who believes them. I don't know how reputable he is, but he actually said it was Manasseh that went to Malay. The hill country where Burma meets India is home to the people called Manmase or Manasseh, who are now claiming descent from the lost tribe of Menashe. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I called Ralph the next morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, you got to see this. Um, so, but I don't, I don't think that's been confirmed genetically. So I don't, I don't know. Just about the, the dispersion uh, aspect, there's, um, you know, the, the, the idea would be that, that the Lehites would have left from the Arabian Peninsula and kind of followed the, the coast going down. There actually was a, a ship captain, I, I want to say part of Alexander the Great's uh, fleet that actually did do that trip. And, and there are some, uh, some, pockets of the population there that claim descendancy from, from Macedonia and, and Greece and stuff like that from, from that trip. So you know, the idea that uh, one, there was a, a whole lot of plausibility of, of making that trip in, in that, that distance, um, you know, from, from Arabia or from the, the middle or from yeah, the Middle East uh, to, to Southeast Asia. Uh, so, you know, that's not out of, out of the question at all. The other thing I should note is for anybody uh, that that really has has hung their hat on the Mesoamerican theory. If you if you watch the uh, the Journey of Faith documentary that um, that kind of uh, talks about the the, the trip out, John Sorensen actually yeah. kind of walks through what he um, 
supposes the trip from Arabian Peninsula to you know the west coast of Central America mm -hmm. would have looked like. And he says, you know, just realistically, you know, it, the text just says many days. You can't get much out of that. But if if they're really on a boat, and they're they're probably you know following the coastline and stopping for water and stopping for food along the way, well, John Sorensen draws this map of like you know kind of through along the coast and kind of down the, the coast of India and then up, and then you run into the Malay Peninsula, and and he kind of has them going going along the side on the west side and then and then through and then into the Pacific. So. Uh, what that means is that even if you don't, if you even if you don't put any stock into the Malay theory at all, and you're more of a, you know, this is definitely Central America, or, or you have to acknowledge that Lehi and Nephi set foot on the Malay Peninsula and stayed there at least as if for a pit stop. Like, let that sink in. Everyone that believes in the Book of Mormon. Uh, that that it was you know populated or th that they came across the Pacific believes that the Lehites were in Malaysia at one point. Like, uh, how do we know they didn't stay? We're, we are seekers of truth, wherever it may be found. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of that Star Trek reference um, with Spock and Captain Kirk, and it's the one. Uh, I can't remember which one. It was one of the one, the one with the. Anyway, um, Spock says, no matter how implausible a theory is, you know, you just have to follow the facts, and that must be what happened. Uh, I'm paraphrasing it terribly, but um, it reminds me of that same sort of thing because I want. I'll, I'll tell you this. I like. I'm rooting for the melee theory. I, it's a fun theory to me. I just think it's fun, and it, and it seems to match a lot of things. But like I said, my my biggest problem with it is how did how did Moroni get from the melee peninsula to New York? Um, that's my biggest problem, and I also don't think necessarily all his language um, parallels are will will definitely definitely hold. I, up. I would agree with that. He has a lot of sections where he's trying to match place names, and it's like, well, you know, this kind of yeah. sounds like this, and this kind of sounds like this. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I think those are, those are pretty weak arguments because you, you can do that pretty much with any, with any map. Uh, if you, if you look at, at, you know, enough place names, you can go, well, that kind of looks like that. And that starts with this. The, the one exception to that, that, that I would say is, um, you know, one of the strongest points, again, with the shape of the, of the peninsula, the side, the, the candidate for the river Sidon, um, you know, pretty, it's, like I, I think this is the, the strongest point is like the actual topography and the, the river that runs in the north side. Like, I mean, it pretty much matches John Sorensen's abstract uh, map uh, almost perfectly. And the city that is that is kind of at the center of that floodplain, the main city that's on that river kind of before it goes into the ocean, uh, it, it's, its current name is Tenamara. And uh, okay, you know whatever that, that doesn't that doesn't seem impressive or anything. But you start lining up the the vowels, um, and uh, and then and then you know e even the, the the similar consonants like uh, you know like in, in Russian T's and Z's uh, are kind of interchangeable. But you can you can kind of see a, a Zarahemla in uh, superimposed over over uh, Tenemara. And um, you know, I, I, in terms of you know language matches, that that's one thing. Like it's there. I've I've been I've been meaning to go there and be like, what's the etymology of this of this town? I, I'm not one to be like, hey, let's write an apologetic book and be like, oh, see, you know, it matches. I, I'm more of just like this. This seems like a line of inquiry worth pursuing. Let's go get to the bottom of this. Um, is there any chance that uh, you know and. And the, the region there of that time period is not very well documented. Most of what we know about what happened on the peninsula during that time comes from records from China. China did some trade and, and some commerce uh, with the area, but even then the, um, yeah, the information is, is scarce. Uh, I would say even more scarce than it is in, in Mesoamerica. But truth exists independent of what anybody thinks about it, right? Everyone used to think the world was flat. The world is round regardless of what everybody believes. Truth exists independent of what people think about. <laughs> That's right. All right, well, um, I think I'm about out of questions. Do you, do you guys have anything that I've missed? Anything else you guys want to add? 
wrapping up the, the Book of Mormon geography theme, I, again, I, I'm not, um, what I've learned through all this is some are better than others. You know, the conventional uh, answers are, are, you know, America and, and you know, the Mesoamerica of America theory has, has very strong points. And, I, you know, I, Ralph is, is very, uh, was very intent on discrediting it. I, I don't think that's really the, the right approach. I think we have to, to see what works, see what, see what doesn't. But we also have to acknowledge that these things are mutually exclusive, right? Most of them are wrong. And, and we have to uh, approach it from that, that point, like anything that you're doing in, in Book of Mormon geography is, is almost certainly wrong. Um, and, you know, there is a possibility that some might be right, but there is also a possibility that they're all wrong. Um, and, and I think that that's important to, to, to as, as you approach these, these types of things, that um, it's, there's, there's no slam dunk, there's no, uh, there's no ace in the hole. And, you know, I, the, I think the best approach is just lay out the evidence and, and see what, uh, what fits best, what reinterpretations are required for this or that. And then, you know, just kind of, instead of thinking like, this is the right one or this is the right one, just kind of see things as a probability density function. It's like, well, you know, this is less likely and more likely and things like that. Oh, you're talking my language now as a, as a statistician. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, just, just seeing it as a, as, a, as a function that hasn't collapsed yet um, is, is probably more fruitful and, and probably can save your sanity better than uh, other methods. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, paint this in, in that, you know, Book of Mormon ge geography is, is, is really a, a place where anyone should gravitate to in terms of uh, uh, faith or, or belief. You know, I, I think the, the Book of Mormon, like I said earlier, is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it, demands, uh, it demands attention. Um, and, and by and large, uh, the attention that, that, it, that it demands, I, I do not believe, has been... Um, has been given yet, and and I, I've been interested in, in, in pursuing those avenues and and really trying to figure out what is going on here, uh, because any reductionist argument leaves things out, and even any oversimplified faithful account uh, leaves things unaccounted for, and to really come up with something that accounts for for everything, um, uh, is is a challenge. Uh, and, and you know, possibly impossible given given our resources and constraints, but uh, I, I think it is uh, it is a worthwhile pursuit. All right. Well, Casey Kern and Greg Pavone, thank you so much um, for being here on Gospel Tangents. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, great, great time talking to you, Rick. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. All right. And if you make it back to the states, we'll definitely have to get together. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Greg Pavone and Casey Kern. Greg and Casey, thank you so much for sitting down with me on this intercontinental uh, interview. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, you guys have done some amazing work, and and it was a lot of a lot of fun to, to talk to you guys. Also, Casey, I want to give you a huge shout out. Clearly, you're a much better video editor than me. And for those of you who didn't watch this on YouTube, you've missed a lot because Casey added some really amazing clips. So, and and got permission to use them too. So, thank you so much, Casey. That was just plain awesome. So you guys should all do a GoFundMe for Casey for editing this. It was, it was awesome. So anyway, thanks again. In our next interview, we're going to talk to a real archaeologist. Dr. Mark Staker works for the LDS Church. And uh, I asked him if he was the official archaeologist for the church. And we'll also find out that uh, he's done some digging in the uh, Joseph Smith Senior Farm in Vermont. So it, it's funny to ask him if he's the official archaeologist for the church. And probably not. We don't have an official archaeologist, but one of my colleagues, Ben Peichels, actually uh, was a professor of archaeology at a university in New York. And so he handles a lot of the, um, the official activities, but we tend to go with outside firms to do most of the work. Um, I did a private uh, dig with... Um, a, a former colleague of mine, we went out together and did this one just on our own because we wanted to. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com 
slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just click the yellow subscribe button and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, GospelTangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at Amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.